It is crossover Thursday here on the Locked On Podcast Network, which means Locked On Steelers meets Locked On Bengals. I'm Chris Carr, host of the Locked On Steelers Podcast. We're going to be joined by Jake and James talking from Locked On Bengals, talking about this matchup. What are the key matchups? What are the key stories? Breaking things down. If you wanted to know how things are looking on the other side of camp, Steelers fans, this is your chance to listen in here, watch here. Again, I'm Chris Carter, host of the Locked On Steelers Podcast. It's going to be a fun crossover episode. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Steelers, your daily Pittsburgh Steelers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Week one of the NFL season is here. The Cincinnati Bengals play host to the Pittsburgh Steelers and it's crossover Thursday here on the Locked On Podcast Network. We're Locked On Steelers and Locked On Bengals today brought to you by Prize Picks Daily Fantasy Made Easy. You just pick two to five players and whether they're going to score more or less than their prize picks projection, you're going to win 10 times your money up to 10 times your money on that entry. First-time users will get a 100% instant deposit bonus match up to $100 with promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. Guys, let's dive into the biggest stories of this week one divisional matchup. I don't remember the last time the Bengals and the Steelers met so early in the season to start the season. Chris Carter from the Locked On Steelers podcast. What's the biggest story for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and why is it that Mitch Trubisky is starting at quarterback? (laughs) That is the biggest story. And part of it's because the Steelers are putting every effort into making sure that Kenny Pickett checks as many of their boxes and to show, hey, he's ready to go and to take on NFL offenses or NFL defenses, excuse me, week after week. Mitch Trubisky has been good during training camp. In fact, in all three of the the preseason games, none of the quarterbacks threw an interception. Mason Roth came the closest with one dropped in the first game against the Seahawks, but all quarterbacks looked efficient. They look, they moved the ball. They found ways to make smart reads um, and they worked well with, with them. And they only got really the most of the first team offense for the, for the last game of the last game of, of the preseason with Deontay Johnson having a bit of a hold in Najee Harris, having a, uh, you know, a, a injury, a Liz Frank sprain that kind of kept them out through most of training camp. But as they started to get their guys back, they started to get their flow back. And I think that was the biggest thing that Mitch Trubisky was able to win over plus his leadership qualities. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of players have said like, hey, this guy came in. He's been a professional. He's set a really good tone. And I think one thing that you're seeing from across the board, all these quarterbacks like each other. There was always a discord with Ben Roethlisberger and Mason Rudolph when he joined the team. Ben Roethlisberger made it clear he didn't like him as soon as he got there. But that's <laughs> all gone in the locker room now. You see Mitch Trubisky, Kenny Pickett, Mason Rudolph all sitting around after drives going over. Hey, this worked. This didn't work. Let's try this. And it seems like that's a friendlier environment right now. And I think it's Mitch Trubisky is kind of the head of that room, but everybody in Pittsburgh, including including the, the, the media and the coaching staff, everyone's watching closely to see when will be the day that Kenny Pickett steps onto the field in a regular season game. I do think it will be sometime this year. So it's not going to be necessarily week one sub package stuff for Kenny Pickett. We're not no. going to see any of that stuff from the Steelers. Now, Chris, before we get to James repeating in the biggest story for the Cincinnati Bengals this week, what, would you have done as you watched the team through the preseason, as you watched this quarterback battle in the preseason, if you were making the choices instead of Mike Tomlin, and I know you're not paid for that, you're paid to cover the team, but I'm curious about your opinion. What would you have done in that circumstance? I'm a bit biased. I covered Kenny Pickett as a, as a guy who covered pit football for the last two, for the last two years. I'm on my third season of that now. Um, and I've I've always loved talking to Kenny Pickett. He's he's a straight shooter. He's so he's laser focused. He's a great individual, great person. Um, and like there was a bit of me that was like, hey, get him more rep, reps with the ones. Uh, but you know what? Early on, I thought going into training camp that he should be getting more of those higher reps. When he got those those reps early on in camp, he was a mess. Like he he wasn't putting it together. It was rough. And there were some there were some questions. Oh man, is, is was this a bad pick? But all it took was a little bit of him settling down, getting closer to game you know a game format instead of you know some practice formats where the pads weren't on. 
And that allowed him to kind of find his element. The one thing I would have done different is towards the end, I would have given him more reps against first team defenses in the NFL uh, to see what it is. But I, I actually agree with this with assessment right now. You know, a lot of people think you gotta you gotta just thrust the quarterback in there. I know Joe Burrow was that was was that way, but you know, Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers, a lot of guys that are top quarterbacks in the league now. They didn't get thrusted in, and I, th I think Kenny does need to take a couple, take a couple, at least a few weeks this season to say, "Hey, this is the NFL speed of how teams are preparing against you and how things are going there." Um, and I think Mitch Trubisky's also done a good job. That's one thing I, I know that he's, you know, he's kind of a disgraced second overall pick, but you know, I've always thought if Mitch Trubisky was a second round pick or even a late first round pick, I don't think people would be on his case as much as he they they were in Chicago, and, and rightfully so because he was a bust as far as a second overall pick goes, but. I think that he'd be a he's a decent bridge quarterback, and he's going to manage the offense so that the defense and the skill players of the offense can win the games. And he, as long as he doesn't lose them, and I think he's done a good job showing that. Certainly, the Pittsburgh Steelers way. That's what they did with Ben Roethlisberger. What thirty years ago was it? How years old is geez. Fifty. <laughs> <laughs> Get the timeline a little mixed up. <laughs> sometimes twenty years ago, maybe. Uh, th that's Close what, to 20. What, we've, what we've seen them do in the past, and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I, I know, and we'll talk about the quarterback probably a little bit more when we talk about the biggest matchups to watch coming up in a little bit. But before we get there, James Rapine from the Lockdown Bengals podcast, what is the biggest story for the Cincinnati Bengals coming into week one? It's keeping Joe Burrow upright which was the biggest story last year. It was the biggest story going into his rookie year. It was the biggest story going into week three against the Steelers last year, even though TJ Watt was out for that game. And uh, it's it's going to be that until they show it. And so Lel Collins is uh, going to be face facing off against TJ Watt. Welcome to Cincinnati, Lel. Uh, you, you had two full team practices against the Rams. Is that enough to get ready for the reigning defensive player of the year? You know, Cordell Volson, the, the rookie left guard out of North Dakota State. Uh, all right. Well, Cam Hayward, have you ever heard of him? Because this isn't one double A anymore. And so that's the part of it where, yeah, Alex Kappa, Ted Karras, Lyle Collins, it looks better. Heck, what I've seen from Cordell Volson, that feels better than what you had at left guard last year for at least half the year, most of the year with Quentin Spain. But can it come together? Will it come together enough for them to be effective in keeping Burrow upright on Sunday, not five weeks from now, this Sunday. I think that's a big question mark. And so will they lean more on the run game early? I could certainly see that. But regardless, I, I think that that's going to follow the Bengals all season long, given how last season ended in Super Bowl 56 with Burrow needing one more second to complete one of the biggest passes in, in Super Bowl history. Yeah, I think certainly all eyes there. Chris, when you hear that biggest story coming out of Cincinnati, what what's your outside perspective been? Or, or I asked you a follow up. Do you have a follow up? No, no, you're fine. Uh, I, I do have a follow. -up. I just, I guess, I my my follow is also a question to James. How has this group come together as an offensive line? Because it's not just the talent, of course, on the offensive yeah. line. There's a lot of respect for Lyle Collins, but how has this group gelled? I know there's been injuries. I know d different guys have had to miss time at at, at, at different points. Have you seen them come together? Because I asked Mike Tomlin, and Mike Tomlin normally does a full rundown of every player he faces in his Tuesday press conference, this guy, that guy, this guy. But when I asked about the offensive line, he's like, you know what? They have some guys that we know and we respect, but we got to see them play together as a unit first before we assess who, how good they are, what challenges they bring. We see their talent. We're going to try to play them our way of football. But how have they come together, James? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think Ted Karras has been kind of the – the straw that's stirring the offensive line drink in that Bengals offensive line room and bringing him in. He was named one of the offensive captains and signing him in free agency. Well, he's won Super Bowls. He's, he's been around great quarterbacks. He's been around great offenses. And so I, I think he's kind of the leader that you need to blend a Cordell Volson who is you know, was at North Dakota State for five seasons with a, a Jonah Williams who went to Alabama. And then on the other side, Alel Collins, who is just hoping to win at this stage of his career and kind of reestablish his value. And then Alex Kappa, who won a ring and just got paid a ton of money after being a third rounder out of Humboldt State. Right. So it, it is a unique blend. I think they're coming together well locker room wise. I think the chemistry is there and everything like that. But communication on field. They don't seem to be concerned about it. Talk to Karis about that today, but you still got to see it. 
And so until we see it, there's going to be questions about it, especially when you're going up against a front like that Steelers defensive front, because obviously that's one of the strengths of their team. And that is one of the matchups that we will talk about. One of the biggest matchups in this game, both ways, I think, is in the trenches and some really fun strength on strength, potentially strength on strength on paper anyway, matchups that we'll dive into when we dive into those biggest matchups that will decide the game coming up next. Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. With Turo, you can book any car you want, wherever you want it, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the US, Canada for Jake Lisko, and the UK. You can book a spacious SUV or a minivan. I know Jake likes the minivan. Chris Carter, you rocking the minivan? Might be rocking the minivan. We know Jake actually goes with a luxury car for those that don't listen to Locked On Bengals. So you could get a luxury car with Toro. You could find something affordable, an economy car like my Daewoo. And all you got to do is test drive any electric vehicle you want or anything like that and ditch the boring rental cars and find your drive at Turo.com. It's that easy. T-U-R-O.com. Find the car for you, whether it's a Mercedes Benz or a Daewoo at Turo.com. Chris, let's start with you as we dive into the biggest matchups in this week one contest between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Pittsburgh Steelers. You have a lot to choose from here. It could be Dan Moore, Trey Hendrickson, could be Chase Claypool in the slot against the much smaller slot corner for the Bengals, Mike Hilton. Could be something like TJ Watt going up against Lyle Collins in Collins' first game against an AFC North opponent, if you can believe it, in his long mm -hmm. NFL career. What are you picking for the biggest matchup for the Pittsburgh Steelers if they want to come out of this game with a W? I, I actually think it's it's not a one on one. It's a it's a group. It's it's Joe Mixon and that offensive line versus the Steelers defensive line and linebackers. Mm -hmm. If I, I truly think that you know when you look at the games last year, that first game the Bengals did control it, but the Steelers, if they ever had a semblance of offense in that game, they would have been in the game. And I think that was the the defense at least was able to hang on and and say, hey, we're giving our offense time to catch up. They just never did. That second game, it busted loose on them. They never stood a chance. And a big reason for that was Joe Mixon getting 165 yards on him. And I think that that is something the Steelers have to control. They've talked all offseason. It was the first time since 1941 that the Steelers finished dead last in rushing defense last year. They have talked so much about not allowing that to happen again. And I truly think that that is – one of the challenges that they're that they've worked to overcome, and I think that they will overcome. Larry Ogunjobi has really up, uh, you know, have been, been a, a good replacement for Stephon Tuitt and where he was for this team two years ago. Cam Hayward is still Cam Hayward. Tyson Alualu is back and healthy. T.J. Watt and Alex Highsmith look ready to go, and they really, really like what Miles Jack has brought at the linebacker position. They're still a little, little worried about about Devin Bush, though. When I asked Mike Tomlin about him, he was very confident about how he put how he finished the preseason. We'll see if that carries over into the game. But if they're able to just, you know, not sh completely shut down Joe Mixon, but limit him 50, 60 yards, keep him from getting close to that 100 range, I think that puts Joe Burrow in more predictable situations. And that allows TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith and that Steelers pass rush to pin their ears back on some key third downs, be a little bit more aggressive and bring some four man rushes that they can they can get try to get home with uh, and maybe even force some rushed passes from Joe Burrow. To me, that is a big key, but it all starts with stopping the run. That's such a Steelers answer. It Linebackers is, a and running backs, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Chuck, listen, I'm from the school of Chuck Noll and Bill Cower, baby. Let's run, run the ball, stop the run, and you win the game. The NFL has changed, my friend. Yeah. James, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, it, look, I, I, I understand that. I, I also think that the Bengals could win this game with Joe Mixon running the ball for, you know, for 3.2 yards a carry if, if – and I'm not saying that's going to happen, by the way. So don't mm -hmm. crush me, Bengals fan. But if this offensive line does what the Bengals hoped it would do when they put it together in March, and, and that's keep Burrow upright, give him enough time. He had no time last year, ever, all right? It was it, it, laughable at, at what that offense did, what he did, what they were able to do, what Jamar Chase did and T. Higgins and, and Tyler Boyd, what all those guys did considering how bad that offensive line was and inconsistent that offensive line was. And you're right, they did get going on the ground and, and the Steelers struggled against that, but they still led the NFL in sacks. 
55 sacks. And so that's what I want to see because I, I want to see, can this offensive line hold up? That doesn't mean TJ Watt isn't going to get pressures. Of course he is. He's a freak. Freaks make plays. Jamar Chase is going to make plays. Breaking news, right? But can they hold up enough to give Joe Burrow time that he really hasn't had ever in his NFL career? Now, there's been plays where he's had it, of course, but consistently, never. We'd have to go back to LSU and watch him and go into Tuscaloosa playing against the Crimson Tide, right? It's it's just mm. it's been that long. So that's even what then, I'm really. I'm curious to see. And even then, you're right, it was a little rough. But point is, that's where my eyes are. That's where my thought is because that's kind of the fly in the ointment that could get in the way of this team reaching its full potential. And obviously, it cost them last year. Did they remedy that problem? We'll see on Sunday. You guys want to talk about these wide receivers, this running game, this offensive yeah. line. I, and I think those are all important. I, I think it's interesting, Chris, that you're talking about the running game for the Bengals, given how much attention Mike Tomlin's defense paid to stopping Jamar Chase in that second game last year. And I know that Joe Mixon was a problem for them, but the resources that the Steelers dedicated to Jamar Chase last year, I thought were really interesting. And I'm going to be interested to see if they do that again. But, but for me, the thing that we haven't talked about is one that I hinted at. I, I gave you I gave you an opportunity to take this one, and, and you didn't like it, Chris. And, well, I wouldn't like it if I was covering the Steelers either or had any interest at all in them winning, and that's Dan Moore Jr. and Trey Hendrickson oh, out yeah. there I mean, at left tackle and right end. The, the thing that I think is a glimmer of hope for the Steelers is DJ Reader and BJ Hill are both very good players, but neither of them are the explosive – get in the backfield right away kind of three technique that the Bengals had in Geno Atkins or to a lesser extent, Larry Ogunjobi, who you're now familiar with uh, playing that uh, pass rushing role on the interior for the Steelers. So there's not really anyone to punish you as much. We'll see about Joseph Osai. Bengals fans, very excited to see him get into the mix against a potentially subpar offensive line for the Steelers. Uh, nobody to really punish the Steelers if they dedicate additional resources to trying to double team Trey Hendrickson when they can. So that's what, what's going to be interesting to me. Do they keep Najee Harrison or whatever running back is in the game at the time to help get a chip on Trey Hendrickson if he's causing a lot of problems on that left side of the Pittsburgh offense? Do they keep P Pat Fryermuth in? And I know he could be a big weapon in the passing game as well. All over the field, though. I think you can find matchups that are very intriguing. The, the ones that I tease at the start, Eli Apple, Chase Claypool, going to be fun. George Pickens, Shadobe Awuzie, the rookie against the, the underrated veteran corner for the Bengals, I think is going to be fun. And uh, we'll see what Mitch Trubisky brings to the field for the Steelers. I think those are all big wild cards that could tilt this game one, one way or the other. I certainly agree with with, with that. And, and Dan Moore Jr., listen, he, he's a big factor in this. Last year, there were games where they just game planned for him to just not, you know, to just, he, they knew that he wasn't going to win matchups. Like there was, they swept the Browns and they faced Miles Garrett both times. And mm -hmm. there was one game where PFF literally gave Dan Moore Jr. a zero on, on uh, for, uh, for a grade. Like that's how, that's how bad it was. But somehow. Sounds like um, me in math class, Chris. Me in math but, class. But, but it was, it was that bad. But, but imagine this, you got the zero. But your group project passed. Like that's how that that's how it came across with Dan Moore Jr. when they were playing the Browns last year. I'll say this: early on in camp, Dan Moore Jr. looked like he was making some real progress. But in the preseason, he started getting whooped and whooped and whooped. And there, there's a lot of concern that it's gonna be it's gonna be rough. But what I, the, what I think the Steelers are gonna do to try to minimize that. They're going to have a lot more moving pockets. They're going to let Mitch Trubisky use his athleticism. And that's the thing. People people don't think about this, but Mitch Trubisky, he's, he likes to run the ball. He likes to take mm -hmm. off if it's there, um, and he will take advantage of it if it's in front of him. So I, I do think Mitch Trubisky, the factor is they'll probably roll him to the right a little bit more. They will leave in. Also, watch out for some, for some 12 personnel. They will be using those tight ends a little bit more this year. Zach Gentry has really come along, uh, third, third or fourth year player out of Michigan, but he's a, he's become a more complete tight end and they like both him and Fryermuth. I wouldn't be surprised if some of those formations are double tight end, two receivers and a single back. And you see Gent Gentry being the one that helps Dan Moore Jr. out while Fryermuth goes into a route, Najee goes into a route, and you have two other receivers doing something. But I do think the Steelers will try to help them out on occasion. They have it in the past. They've often said, hey, you got to get the job done by yourself because we're running all these other plays. They also really like their skill position players. But certainly, yeah. if Trey Henderson gets, gets, that, gets him lined up, that could be a major advantage for the Bengals. Chris, do you think 
that this offense with Mitch Trubisky, do you think it's going to be a bunch of quick game stuff where it's one read and, you know, he can make a decision and then run it if he needs to, or he's throwing to Deontay Johnson on a screen or Najee Harris in the flat or Frymuth, and then some go balls? Because you're right, they got some dudes on the outside that can get downfield. Like, is, is that it? Is there going to be an intermediate game, I guess, to the Steelers offense, or is it going to be go deep and go short? Well, that's what the that's what the offense was last year, right? It was quick pass Ben Roethlisberger or throw the or throw the the, the go route down the sideline. That's not going to be the case this year. In all of the practices I've seen in all the preseason games, they're actually targeting the middle part of the field. And if you ever watched Ben Roethlisberger's passing chart for the past like two or three years, it's like red down the sidelines, red up to like five yards, and everything else is just blew up the middle because he just mm-hmm. wouldn't throw there. And it's just, it was so bizarre. And we'd be like, and, and the point, the times when he threw there, it often worked. And we're like, why doesn't he do this more? It would just drive people nuts. But um, what I've seen from them is they're throwing, they're, they're running deeper crossing patterns. They're letting Pat Frymuth work the middle part of the field. They're letting Chase Claypool work the middle part of the field. They're loving using him in the slot more this year, which is something that Steelers fans have been screaming for for the past, since he was a rookie. I, I think mm-hmm. that you're going to see this offense target all different parts of the field. There will be some quick reads to make things easier for Trubisky, but they trust him as a veteran. They're going to say, hey, we're going to give you the reins to be able to do some things here and there. But their biggest thing is don't turn the ball over. Limit the turnovers and take what's in front of you. And eventually, and I think what you're going to see with this too is if they can hit on a couple deep balls, whether even even if it's like you know a 15, 20 yard pass to to kind of get the get the ball down the field, that's going to slow down the linebackers. That's going to stop them from taking those first two steps up to the line of scrimmage, and that's going to open up Najee Harris, which is really what they want to run this offense through. If they can show people that they can they can now throw the ball again further down the field, it'll give Najee and the offensive line more space to work with, and then I think they'll achieve the balance that that candidate, the offensive coordinator is aiming for. Sounds like the Pittsburgh Steelers are trying to run back 2004 to me and Ben Roethlisberger's rookie year a little bit from an approach perspective. Guys, we got to dive into some predictions here. It's, it's that time. James, let's start with you. Your prediction wow. For go. this game where we see a low over under in the in the low 40s and the Bengals heavily favored in the home opener coming off their Super Bowl run. Yeah, heavily favored. You check out bet online and, and that's the, the way, you know, it's going. But to me, I think this is going to be a slow AFC North start where the defenses get off to a better start than the offenses. And Joe Burrow goes through the feeling out process of what the Steelers are doing. And Mitch Trubisky, Mitch Trubisky settles in and his first start with the Steelers. And it takes a little time for these offenses to get going. And I think it's going to be a close game and a one possession game uh, at six and a half. I'd probably take the points for the Steelers as of now. That's how I lean. I do think the Bengals get it done, though, because if you just say it out loud, the Bengals have the better quarterback. I think they have the better offensive line. The Steelers have more stars on defense and probably the better defense overall, but it's closer. And so when you look at all of those things and you mix it all together, especially the Bengals are at home, it's going to be a record-setting crowd at Paycor Stadium. I think it's going to be close. I'll take the Bengals 24-20. They get to 1-0 and and avoid a letdown, even though I think the Steelers kind of going under the radar. I don't know. Maybe Steelers fans think I'm crazy. I think they're better than the national perspective and people thinking that they're going to finish fourth in this division. I'm not there. So I think it's going to be a close game. I'll take the Bengals 24-20. You know, I saw a division preview today for the AFC North that had the Steelers and the Browns tied at eight and nine. And I guess the Steelers lost a tiebreaker in that chant in that in that example. And the the Ravens and the Bengals, I think, were both eleven and six. And and so like they just had the AFC North being very tight. And I could see that. But we're focused on week one. It was last year. year. It was last year. So yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And it could be again. We're focused on week one, like I said, here on this crossover Thursday. Chris Carter from the Locked On Steelers side of things. How do you see this game going where the Steelers, in, in usually a very heightened week for Bengals fans, certainly, looking looking at their opponent, are heavy underdogs in week one? Yeah, no, absolutely. The Steelers, I actually think this is going to go similar to how James is saying. It's going to be very, I think it's going to be lower scoring. I don't think this is going to be a, a, a shootout. You know, by any means, I think that you're going to see some sloppy play from the offenses. I think you're going to see some uh, some more dominant play, but from the defense, uh, you know, a lot of a lot more punts in this game. 
uh, than maybe Bengals fans were used to at the end of last season. Um, and I think it's going to come, come down to who gets to play their style of game first, you know, especially on offense. You know, can the can the Bengals establish the balance that they liked last year with Joe Mixon running and then Joe Burrow being able to kind of play off that find the open man where and, and, and work their work their offense vice versa if the Steelers can find a way to get play action going for Mitch Trubisky and get the get the, the safeties and linebackers to hesitate to let Najee Harris get going I think that's their edge but ultimately I think that the, the chance the Steelers have here last year they went into Buffalo and no one gave them a chance they pulled off the upset because that's just what Mike Tomlin does. He gets his guys to believe in winning games like this. I think they do it again in a similar fashion that James is saying there. I'm going – I I was going to go 24-20, but James took that score. So I'm going to go <laughs> 26-21. So, uh, that sounds obscure enough that that, that, could, that could come true. I think that Joe Burrow has a good game in this one, but it's going to be a slowed pace. I think the Steelers are going to try to have some elongated drives, but Chris Boswell being the kicker that he is, I think he's going to have a really strong day for them. They won't be able to finish some of their drives, but he'll win. He'll make just enough field goals to give them the chance to say, hey, we're going to hold on to a lead. It'll come down to a late drive, and I think in that late drive, that's when the Steelers' defense, they get to pin their ears back. You'll get a Minka Fitzpatrick interception, and that's how they'll win the game. How, so you far, have four you have four Boswell field goals and two touchdowns. Interesting. That'd be a big hey, day. That would that would be a crazy day. But you know, I, again, I think it's going to be. I think you'll have some turnovers from the defense to help that. Uh, but you know, this is the this is the team that, that that they found a way to win. Even when Ben Roethlisberger was in his prime, they found a way to win with Ben with Chris Boswell making like six field goals in a single game in a playoff game. Like they, mm-hmm. this is Mike Tomlin's element, and that that is what if Mike if this was Bill Cowher as the head coach for the Steelers, I wouldn't be picking them to win. But Mike Tomlin, he lives for these type of weeks, and I think that he's got something cooking right now. I think sometimes you're just outmatched. I mean, six drives for the Steelers getting deep enough into Bengals territory to score points would, to me, be a little bit surprising, and we'll see. I mean, I just went on the record saying that a specific thing would be surprising, so someone might might come back and make me eat crow on that one. But you're right. Turnovers are certainly an X factor and one that we haven't really talked about and one that I think might actually favor the Bengals just going back to – where we started the show, the biggest story for these teams is Mitch Trubisky starting a quarterback and bringing a real unpredictable element to this game. It's been Ben Roethlisberger in Pittsburgh for so long, a new starting quarterback taking over that we haven't really seen play a whole lot of football since he was run out of Chicago and forced into the life of a glorious or or glorified backup, one of the more sought after backups in his free agency period. But he's taking over for the Steelers, and and that is going to have a big impact on this game. And on the other side of things, the Cincinnati Bengals rolling out a remade offensive line that will be trying to establish the run potentially early in this game with Joe Mixon as they try to find time for these guys to gel. As we've mentioned, they did not get on the field together in the preseason. Mike Tomlin mentioned that he needs to see how those guys play together. And honestly, so do the Bengals and Bengals fans, as we've talked about on Lockdown Bengals, one of the big answers we're looking for in this game is this the first time this remade offensive line for the Bengals gets on the field together we've also talked about some of the big matchups in this game and Chris if you want to hit that again from the Steelers perspective as we recap our show what do you got I mean, a big matchup. I think one thing you pointed out is can they protect Mitch Trubisky? That's going to be interesting. I also think a huge matchup is how these Steelers corners match up with the Bengals wide receivers. The Bengals wide receiver is a better group, but this is a group that when I asked Mike Tomlin, what's your biggest confidence point about the, about these Steelers cornerbacks? He said they're they're above the neck ability. They think well. They're all veterans. All of them have like four, five, six years of experience. They don't have to question them. They know, hey, you know where to be. You know that this is on you. Get it done and just don't give up the big play. If the Steelers can limit the the Bengals receivers like Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd, if they can keep those guys from ripping off the head of the defense with those deep balls and allow Minka Fitzpatrick to play in more of a roaming role where he doesn't have to support one person like he did in the past when it was Ross Cockrell or it was Artie Burns or it was Cody Sensabaugh, all these guys, Levi Wallace, Akella Witherspoon, Cam Sutton, they're confident that these guys can hold down those spots. As long as they don't get picked on, I'm not saying that they won't give up decent yards in this game, but as long as they don't get picked on and abused, I think that that's another big factor that can play into this game, uh, along with shutting down Joe Mixon. 
And we'll all remember from that week or that week three contest last year, Jamar Chase's 34 yard touchdown catch mm-hmm. going into the half that proved to be a pretty dis- decisive factor in that game. It was seven to seven at that point going into halftime in a game the Bengals ended up winning 24 to 10. James, we've talked about some matchups from the Bengals perspective that we talked about on Lockdown Bengals as well. What, let's just recap that biggest matchup for the Cincinnati Bengals this week. Well, it's, it's certainly the offensive line and and how they match up with the defense. And so that's, it's the the story. It's the story that surrounds the Bengals because no one is questioning how great the skill players are or Joe Burrow. Well, I guess some out there still question Joe Burrow, but that's silly at this stage. Um, so yeah, you look at it, this offense should be really, really good this year. And, and so it comes down to this offensive line. And if this offensive line brings the edge that I think the Bengals are expecting, then they should have one of the better offenses in the league. And I think the defense goes under the radar. So it's going to be fun to see them go out there against a, a really talented Steelers team, even on offense. I know people are talking about Mitch Trubisky and I would have went with Kenny Pickett personally, but there's still plenty of time to go with him. And so we'll see because a guy like Mitch Trubisky is dangerous in this role where you haven't had any Pittsburgh film, I get preseason, but it's preseason, any true Pittsburgh film on him, there could be some wrinkles. And so Lou Rumo, the Bengals defensive coordinator is going to need to be ready. So a lot of storylines that could, that could come out of this one. And uh, it's a big AFC North matchup. And gentlemen, this is the first time ever that the Bengals and Steelers are playing in week one. So wow. I didn't on know that. Sunday. There you go. In That's Cincinnati, crazy. of all places, where we couldn't get a home opener for years, <laughs> and so- suddenly go to the Super Bowl, they give you home openers. Big division matchup here in week one, and weird things happen in week one. James, you mentioned wrinkles. There will be wrinkles on both sides. Both teams need to be ready to adapt and change their game plans from the first quarter on. And, of course, we have you covered with your daily coverage of the Pittsburgh Steelers over on Locked On Steelers with Chris Carter on Locked On Bengals with myself, Jake Lisko, and my host, my co-host, your co-host, James Rapine, also on Locked On Bengals. We've got you covered daily here on the Locked On Podcast Network, and we'll have you covered with game previews and game recaps coming your way next. Thanks for listening to this Crossover Thursday episode as we gear up for week one here Bengals, Steelers coming up on Sunday.